Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming to my presentation today. My name is Jason Gold. I'm currently teaching at Kobe University in Japan. And today I'll be talking about higher education, academic identity formation, and some educator implications. To start off, why did I choose this topic? Uh, several years ago, I first came across Carol Dweck's learner mindset theory, and this really resonated with me. I really liked this theory. Over the years, I've read more about this theory and came across uh, Dweck and colleagues' um, academic tenacity model that I've been trying to apply to higher education. So in addition to learner mindsets, which I'll be explaining uh, a little later today, it also consists of things like students' academic perseverance, all the factors that go into that, their achievement goals, and um, academic identity. So why are students successful in university? What makes students successful? These three, the past few years, I've had chances to read and learn about, but uh, academic identity, social belonging was a gap in my knowledge. So I wanted to use this to fill that, to learn more about uh, this area and how it impacts academic tenacity of students. Another model I like a lot, Nagalka and colleagues, young adults um, developmental framework, also um, consists of a lot of the same factors, mindset, self-regulation, student agency, and uh, integrated identity. So I wanted to learn more of how these uh, fit into those. So going through the literature, um, I realized there's a huge amount of research on identity, academic identity. A lot of it specifically concerns schools' influence on racial or cultural, ethnic, gender identity development. However, my current teaching and research population context consists of homogenous, nearly all Japanese, middle to upper socioeconomic status, university students at fairly high level um, universities look something like this. So my overall research goal, as well as better understanding of what academic tenacity looks like specifically for my population, what factors influence it, how it evolves over time, of which academic identity is a key part of. So I chose to delimit um, my research scope, today's presentation to general identity dimensions, personal and social, focusing on higher education specifically. So first off, why is this topic important? Why should we as educators care about our students' academic identity? So the transition to higher education is a really important time in our students' lives since it coincides with the major part of their identity construction. K through 12 has been pretty rigid and formulaic. Now they're coming to an entirely new environment in university. This is their main chance as young adolescents to reinvent, discover who they are, who they want to become, also figure out their academic path, their major, and eventually their career path as well. So their academic identity ultimately shapes how they perceive learning and school overall. It influences all of their behaviors and choices during university and thus affects their overall academic achievement. So it's important for us as educators to uh, understand and know this. So going through all the literature, I came across two main epistemological perspectives regarding academic um, identity the psychosocial cognitive perspective, which focuses more on the uh, internal psychological constructs and processes that go into students' identity. So things like their sense of purpose, self-evaluation, emotional regulation, agency, a lot of the other selfs, self-concept, self-efficacy, self-esteem, it focuses on the internal psychological. And conversely, the other main perspective I came across was the sociocultural perspective. This one views student identity not as internal, but multi-dimensional phenomenon. Students have a range of different identities across their disciplines, the classes that they're in, the skills that they have. So development is more of a holistic process. So it's necessary to examine how student identities evolve as a product of their relations to others in different sociocultural contexts. So from all of the literature I read, I came across uh, four theories models that I liked regarding um, higher ed academic identity. Two are the psychosocial, there'll be P in the following slides, Carol Dweck's learner mindset theory and James Marcia's adolescent identity development model. 
Sociocultural, which will be S in the following slides, McFarland's higher education learner identity model, Bonnie Norton's second language acquisition identity theory, particularly her concept of investment. So I'll get started with these. So first theory, uh, Carol Dweck's learner mindset theory. This is a very big theory, but just in a nutshell, uh, Carol Dweck and her colleagues noticed um, most schools tend to focus on students' intelligence and abilities through rigorous curriculum, through standardized testing. However, her research showed um, it's not students' intelligence or ability per se that's the main factor in their academic achievement, but their belief about their intelligence and ability and that overall. So she came up with two different mindsets on a spectrum. Um, on one extreme, we have a fixed mindset that believes intelligence is static. It's fixed, you're born with what you have, you can't do much to improve it. And at the other extreme is a growth mindset where intelligence can always be developed. So her research showed which of these two mindsets students have leads to a cascade of different thoughts, beliefs, actions, experiences throughout their um, educational tenure, which influences the outcomes as well. So uh, real briefly, a fixed mindset because they believe intelligence is fixed. These students tend to focus on looking smart or hiding their weaknesses and not trying to embarrass themselves. This leads to a tendency to a number of kind of self-limiting behaviors. These students tend to avoid challenges because there's a chance that they'll risk making mistakes, looking stupid. Um, obstacles, they tend to give up more easily. Effort they see as something that's not really necessary. If you're smart or have talent, you don't need it. And if you do need it, there's not really much it can do for you because you're, you're born with a certain amount of intelligence ability. Uh, constructive criticism, they don't really like. They focus just on the positives and ignore the negatives and they feel threatened by success of others. So enough of these tendencies over time um, can result in students self-limiting themselves, plateauing early, achieving less than their full potential. And students are not one or the other of these. It's not black and white, it's on a spectrum and different domains, students might be more one or the other, but overall students have one of these tendencies. The second is a growth mindset, the belief that intelligence ability can be grown. These students naturally um, tend to do better in school because they embrace challenges, they try harder things, they risk things. Um, they see effort as necessity to mastery. Because of this, they're much more resilient in the face of setbacks, mistakes, failures. They can learn from constructive criticism. They wanna know not just their strengths, but their weaknesses, how to shore them up, and can find success, inspiration, and the success of others. So as a result of all of these tendencies over time, these students achieve higher academic um, results. And her research showed that growth mindset students do much better in school than fixed mindset, because they have agency, they believe their life, their future is in their hands, they can always shape it. So which of these mindset students have plays a big part on the academic identity and what their position is in learning and university. The second uh, psychosocial model is Marcia's adolescent identity model. It consists of a balance of two main factors. Um, we have crisis which in psychology just means like active exploration and commitment, deciding on um, an ultimate identity formation. So he posited that students, people go through four stages. Um, there are four statuses. So low crisis, low commitment, he called diffusion. This is when students are not really doing much of anything to form an identity. They don't know why they're in school. They don't have any clear goals. They're not making any effort to figure this out. These are the students who maybe come to class late, forget their assignments, um, don't do so well. If they stay in this state long enough, they're at risk. Um, their grades will start to suffer. They may start missing classes, fail, um, drop out. So we don't want students in diffusion very long. Low crisis, high commitment is called foreclosure. This is when students decide on an academic identity too soon without having taken the time to actively explore different options and see how it meshes with their values or goals. We see this sometimes when students just have an idea of what they wanna be in the future. Like, I wanna be a doctor, I wanna be a lawyer without actually 
doing the work and seeing what that entails and if it meshes with their life goals or their parents or doctors or lawyers or have a business and it's been decided that they'll do so as well. These students may or may not do well in school. It depends, but um, later in life when there's a conflict between the identity that they chose and um, their values, there are issues that arise. So our goal, Marcy explained, is to have students in this area. High crisis, low commitment is moratorium. This just means active exploration. Students are actively trying out different interests, different things, different majors, classes, different um, club activities to figure out who they are, who they wanna become. After enough moratorium, the goal is to, for them to reach achievement, to have decided on a major that they love that fits with who they are and later on a career as well. The first uh, socio-cultural model is McFarland's higher education one. It was hard to find a model of just general academic identity that didn't specifically talk about ethnicity or um, gender, but uh, I like her model. It discusses an interplay of six factors that influence their uh, university identities. So it consists of some psychosocial constructs like academic skills, independent learning. These are important during the transition to higher education. But her research showed that these social constructs were key in students forming um, academic identities, being successful during their time in university. So their social relations with their peers and their teachers was key. Their engagement with the coursework and relating it back to their social cultural backgrounds, their sense of belonging in the classroom, in the university as a whole, the identity positions that were open to them. So social aspects were key in that. And lastly is uh, Bonnie Norton's second language acquisition identity theory. So for me, my teaching context, I teach mostly EAP courses, uh, English for academic purposes, but I still wanted to find some theory that tied into SLA because that is part of my construct teaching second language learners. So um, Bonnie Norton's theory focuses on SLA, but it can easily be applied to any context. Pretty much she noticed the psychosocial theories believe motivation is solely a character trait of the individual. So in this belief, learners who fail to learn, they're simply not motivated enough to learn. So she had issues with this belief. Um, it didn't take into account a number of factors. The fact that motivation is socially constructed, it changes across time and spaces, and higher levels of learner motivation don't always necessarily translate into effective learning. So as a complement to the psychological construct of motivation, she um, came up with the social construct of investment, which pertains to students' commitment to learn anything, a language, whatever, based on their hopes for the future and their imagined identities um, regarding that. So it consists of the confluence of three areas, um, positioning, affordances and constraints, and patterns of control. I'm not gonna go into this, but um, in a nutshell, if students have little investment in the practices of a given classroom or community, uh, it'll lead to disengagement and poor learning outcomes. So little investment can come when their abilities and interests don't match well with the activities of the class, the classroom learning style of the teacher and the classmates, or their participation access to certain identity positions is constrained by stereotype labels because they're um, a woman or because of their religion, their ethnicity, they feel they can't have access to certain paths. So it's important for teachers to keep in mind this idea of investment that this connection is key, how it influences their academic identity. So instead of teachers viewing quiet or disengaged students as unmotivated, it's much more productive, important to ascertain to what extent they're invested in the language literacy practices of the classroom. So what does it mean to them to learn English, to be an English language speaker? How does that tie into their major, to their, their ideal futures is key for us to figure out. So now I'll move on to the so what, why do we care about this? The educator implications and a few uh, instructional strategies regarding um, academic identity. So as we've seen from these um, models that I discussed, psychosocial and sociocultural perspectives, they both offer unique valuable insights. 
Um, understanding academic identity as a whole requires both personal social dimensions. So educators should strive for a synthesis of these to discern all the factors that influence our students' academic identity, which ultimately influence their academic achievements. So based on the models and the literature, I'll just give five general recommendations and some brief strategies on how to use this with our classes. So first is to foster a growth mindset. I explicitly teach this to some of my students. Fixed growth is useful for them to understand the difference and to use the language in class. But shy of that, um, we should celebrate effort as necessary for growth and normalize mistakes over perfectionism. So I tell my students 100% like at initially are not good. It means it's too easy for you. You guys are not learning. We, I want my students to make mistakes and I want them to be okay with those mistakes, learning how to reflect and analyze and improve upon them so they don't make the mistake again. So two mistakes, the same mistake twice is not good, but mistakes are part of the natural learning process. Also, Dweck's research showed um, the praise that we give is important. We should give effort process praise versus ability person praise. So ability praise research shows leads to fixed mindsets in students, telling students that they're so smart or they're a natural at this. Um, it focuses on the natural intelligence or ability as most important which is out of their control. So once they are in a context that it's not easy for them, that they do struggle, they won't know how to respond. Instead, effort praise leads to growth mindsets. So fostering the belief that effort, which is always under their control, is necessary, is essential for their growth and academic achievement. And the way I try to do this is um, regarding feedback. So trying to give customized feedback as much as possible. It's very hard with large classes, but contrasting the growth of a prior assignments whenever possible. So since moving online with Google Classroom and Google Docs, it's a little easier to open up their past Google Doc homework and read my comments and just try to incorporate it into this week's assignment reflection feedback for them. The second uh, strategy is to provide various rich experiences. So we need to design our curriculum, our classroom activities to prevent students from remaining in diffusion, not actively working towards an identity or foreclosure, choosing an identity too quickly and being closed off to many other potential paths that they could take that may actually be better for them. So we can do this two ways. One way is to immerse them in moratorium, active exploration via in-breath exploration, which is just various new learning content activities that enables them to figure out new interests, undiscovered talents, uh, new identity positions. So how I go about this is choosing a wide range of topics, genres, and disciplines for class materials. Um, lots of different YouTube TED Talk videos, different listenings, different readings. Um, also allowing student choice alternatives on many assignments or big projects to let them figure out the things that maybe interest them to delve more into. So um, for writing activities or self-study projects for TOEFL TOEIC seminars where students can choose to make a travel itinerary or review products or watch a TED talk and summarize or choose a Wikipedia topic and go deeper into it, letting them have autonomy is key. And the other way to provide experiences is to help them reach achievement choosing an identity via in-depth exploration. So giving them chances to acknowledge their sense of who they are and want to be and uh, supporting their commitment. So this looks the same, the same strategy, giving student options is key. This lets them go deeper into areas. So some students will choose the same kind of topic for both activities in a semester that I give them. But the second time they'll go deeper into it um, because they found something that interests them, which is completely fine by me. Third is to provide ample opportunities for reflection. So students don't learn from experience per se, but from reflecting on experience. So experience has to be assigned meaning. It has to be integrated into students' sense of self to have long lasting benefits to go into their long-term memory, to be retrieved at a later time, et cetera. 
So this is a very simple um, model of the reflection process, but learning has to follow, or learning leads to some kind of action the students do, some activity that has to lead to reflection about that before new learning can occur and around we go. So this cycle helps them better understand their thoughts and feelings about what they learned about the content, who they are, who they want to become. So strategy for this is um, I incorporate self-reflection activities in every single assignment students do. They always need to reflect on something, plus have chances to share those reflections with um, their classmates. So just very simply, um, for like textbook reading activities, the homework they do, there's always a question, what's something new or interesting they learned? And what's their opinion or impression about the reading, about the topics of the reading? either for them, for their country, or for the world, etc. So they have choices amongst these to reflect and to share with classmates. Strategy four is to create personal relevance. So it's important to show how, of course, academic content is relevant to their present as well as their future lives. Um, we tend to take this for granted, but it's important to explicitly tell this to students when we're going through lessons each time, and also to get students to recognize themselves in the content and the materials. So students need to be able to feel their space for who they are outside the class, in the class, they have to be able to bring that in. And also for what they learn in the classroom has to apply to who they are outside the classroom, their goals and dreams. So we need to situate learning in their lives, in their culture, utilizing their funds of knowledge. And the strategy for this, similar to the last one, is I always have some kind of connection question regarding readings or listenings or videos. Students have to connect what they've just learned to something about their lives or an experience of someone that they know um, to Japan or another country or to some media source like a movie or TV show or anime, just so that they take that extra effort to make the connection between the lesson and themselves, their life, and how it'll apply, be useful in the future. And the last strategy is to foster social belonging and a supportive classroom climate. So moratorium active exploration involves risk and discomfort. It has, they have to move outside their comfort zone to do this. So it requires a certain degree of courage on their part. So that's why a classroom culture of social belonging is so important especially these days when we're doing distance classes and there's an extra level of removal between us and the students and their classmates. So they have to feel safe um, to take risks to try out new positions. So lots of research has shown that students who feel included or respected by their peers and their teachers spend less time worrying about what everyone thinks about them. They could focus on the tasks at hand. So strategies for this, um, again, I could do a whole presentation just on this number five, but um, it's just lots of activities that allow students to learn about each other's interests, what they have in common, and a genuine growth mindset, teacher compliments, striving for warm teacher-student relationships, sharing about our own life. This was the number one feedback comment I got this past semester. Students want to know more about my life, my interests, my experiences. So face-to-face, -face, I that, do that usually pretty easily. But online, there was a bit of a disconnect. So I need to work on that a bit more. So one activity I love to do with all my classes, the first day of class is an interest inventory. I have um, this in inventory with a bunch of categories on the left that students want to know about each other. And um, my example answers here on the right, my picture, my name. Students take a look at that for homework and delete that, add their picture, add their information. Face-to-face -face classes, they print these out and exchange them beginning of each class and have a short warm-up discussion, finding things in common or recommendations for each other. Online, um, I could do it in breakout sessions. And also it was cool using uh, Google Sheet, Google Doc links for the whole class to be able to access each other's at any time to get to know each other more. So uh, conclusion, some key takeaways. Students' academic identity encompasses the psychological internal aspects as well as the sociocultural contextual factors. So the kind of academic identity students develop shapes how they perceive learning and school. It influences their behaviors and choices. 
and their overall academic achievement, which is why it's so important for us to keep in mind. So for us as educators, we have to be aware of all of these factors and design our curriculum classroom instruction to best cultivate it. All right, guys, my references, and thank you so much for listening.